Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Knorr, uh, product manager for cloud storage. And here with me today is Mike Yu, a senior staff uh, software engineer, uh, who will be joining us for, this, for the second half of the presentation. Uh, this is about, all about cloud storage. So this is our object store. Uh, we realized looking at the, the, the session title uh, the last couple of days that we actually didn't have the product name in the, the, uh, the title. So hopefully all of you care, are here and care about uh, object storage. And uh, we're going to be going through best practices, uh, outlining some of our most recent changes to uh, storage classes, and also uh, providing some, hopefully, some good guidance on how to make use of the product, uh, especially when it comes to performance. So uh, I'll, I'll start out. I'll keep the, the I'll keep the marketing content to a bare minimum. I promise. Just a couple of slides uh, to introduce uh, cloud storage. Um, but then focus in on storage classes and how best to apply them, particularly in the case of content serving. Uh, then we'll look at the same thing for the application of storage classes to, con to compute and analytics workloads. And then um, finally get into some meat on performance and scaling. So let's dig into the introduction. Uh, so you know, Google Cloud. Uh, for Google Cloud, cloud storage has been really one of the core storage por uh, portfolio products uh, from the beginning. And uh, we've, we've really cared about ha making sure that there's a unified experience across uh, no matter how you use cloud storage. So as you'll hear in the, in the storage classes section, uh, that's something that we've continued to stress with consistent APIs and access. Strongly consistent listings have also been part of the product. Um, so it doesn't matter when you, when you list, when you upload a product, uh, when you upload objects, you'll, as, as soon as you list them, you'll be able to see the, the upload changes. There's, there aren't any consistency challenges the way you might see with, with other cloud storage uh, offerings from, from, from other, other cloud providers. Uh, Geo-redundancy, so all of cloud storage is built around a global approach to storage. So we have regions, dual regions, multi-regions, and we make it very easy to actually have your storage distributed uh, with geo-redundancy. And, uh, and then finally, of course, what you would expect from cloud scalability, you know, no matter whether you need gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, or exabytes of storage. So this is all made possible based on the enormous investments that Google has made in co core infrastructure. So you know, this, this, of course, started long before uh, GCP actually existed. It, it, this infrastructure was actually put in place to support search, YouTube, Gmail, all the other big properties. And then once you have, uh, once you have all these subsea cable investments and points of presence globally and the ability to do all of that content distribution, that's the ideal infrastructure to build a public cloud uh, solution on top of. And so what you'll see is that we actually um, have a great leverage of all of that infrastructure and it, it continue to bring on board uh, new regions. Some of the most recent ones include um, Finland uh, in the Nordics. Uh, in Europe, we've brought on board. Um, so Hong Kong turned up relatively recently. Uh, Osaka has just, just been announced. Uh, Salt Lake City. So we have new regions sprouting up everywhere, uh, all connected with very fast uh, networking infrastructure. The three primary use cases that you'll see for cloud storage are content storage and delivery. And that leverages the, the network that we just talked about, right? How do, you bring, how do you bring your objects and make them available globally with high performance? Uh, compute and an analytics and machine learning, of course, are taking a, a great amount of interest. And Google is seen generally as being one of the, the, the real leaders in, in, a, in, the, in this area. And then finally, we have a lot of bar backup and archiving use cases as well. Um, so here you see just a handful of, 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 of uh, household names that, that use uh, cloud storage in each of these areas. So let's dig into now uh, some of the most recent changes in storage classes. So storage classes really dictate how we place your data, like what regions, and, and, and then, of course, what the, the hotness and coldness of the data, how frequently you access it. And up until, uh, up until today, um, you actually, we've had a mix of location with, with hotness and coldness of data in the storage class name. So we've had this gen general uh, concept of storage class. Multi-regional and regional uh, were both the hottest classes, but those referred to the locations uh, where, where multi-regional was, was geo-redundant, 
and regional lock down the data to a specific location. And then we had near line and cold line for, for the archival use cases, but you could actually also use those in a regional or a multi-regional location. So we felt like this was actually a little bit confusing uh, to customers, and so we're in the middle of rolling out uh, changes that will make this a little bit simpler. So basically what we're looking to do is we're, we're going to be separating out the location type from the storage class and, and only using storage classes to mean uh, the, the data temperature, the frequency of access. So standard is the most frequently accessed. Then as the data gets colder, you go to near line and then go to cold line. And uh, it's a consistent set of APIs uh, no matter what storage class you're using. And then similarly on location type, this really dictates the, the, the amount of geo-redundancy and where your data is stored generally, right? So if you're stored in a region, you know, you'll know that all of your data is in that specific region. If you're in a multi-region, you'll be aligned to a continent. So this will generally be, for example, the United States, uh, the European Union, or the Asia-Pacific region. And then your data will be at least in two places somewhere in that continent. And then dual regions are the best of both worlds where you know exactly where your data is. It's in two specific regions, and that allows you to co-locate your compute with your storage. And if you go up and down within that stack from standard to near line to cold line, it, the, geo, the geo redundancy is preserved. So in the past, near line and cold line had regional characteristics, even if it was stored in a multi regional location. So that's something that we've improved as of last October, um, that now the geo redundancy stays cons consistent as you go up and down uh, within, uh, within your buckets. Oops, that was. So here are examples of regions, multi-regions, and dual regions, going back to that globe map. So the, the big green circles uh, uh, there are illustrating uh, the US and the Asia Pacific uh, multi-regions. Uh, there are two smaller uh, ovals that are dual regions, one in Europe and one in North America, where those are locked down to two specific regions. And then all of the individual uh, uh, spots there are individual regions that, that we provide service in. So why, why pick a particular location type? So regions uh, offer the lowest possible price point and are, are specifically uh, locked around one data center. So if you have jurisdictional reasons, for example, to, to you want to make sure that data stays in a particular country, for example, especially in, in Asia or in Europe, um, that's one reason, popular reason to ch choose regional. Um, do, the other, the other approach is basically for co-location, as you'll hear as we get into, the, the, into some of the other uh, specific use cases. Um, dual regions keeps it locked down, like I said, but with, with actually two regions in the mix. That gives you the, uh, the higher availability characteristics um, without sacrificing the, the knowledge that your data is in specific locations. Um, but if you don't care where your data is, you just want it to be very high availability and you want it to be stored in mo more than one region, uh, multi-region basically gives you a, a price cut from dual regions, and, it'll, and it gives Google the freedom to store your data in whatever data centers within that region um, as makes sense. So particularly for content delivery, we see a lot of use of multi-regions. So this is what happens with data placement. If you pick a region, all of your objects end up in that region. So uh, the green boxes here in, under region B assume that you've selected region B as your region uh, for, for, that, for that particular uh, bucket. If you picked a multi-region uh, in, the, in the red color, um, here you can see that different objects, they're still in at least two regions, but it's basically randomized per, prod, per object. So you don't really know for any given object what region they're going to be in, but you know that they're geo-redundant. Uh, whereas here again, in, for the dual region, um, this dual region happens to be region B and C, and so your objects are always in those two locations. So a big announcement that we made this morning uh, is that we're actually adding a new archive storage class. So this is directly aimed at tape replacement needs and other very long-term uh, other long-term storage requirements. So if you're planning on keeping your data around for three, five, seven, ten years, don't expect to access it, would have considered to put it on tape before, this is an ideal solution for, for, for th those sorts of needs. So this really just adds a, a, a another tier um, to the storage classes, and basically you'll be able to go from storage, from standard to near line to cold line, and now to archive, and have 
uh, really a full suite of storage class selections for all of your needs. And as you can see, um, we're talking about starting at a, at a, a price point of 0.12 cents. So this is a very appealing price point. Um, but at the same time, um, this is not a storage class that's gl glacially slow. Um, you, it has the same performance characteristics as all the other storage classes, so you don't need to actually restore data. So if you have 10 petabytes of storage and that was stored on tape, you might be talking about weeks of time to restore the data. In this case, the data is right there, immediate, immediately available for your access. You don't have to first restore it to another bucket under another storage class to be able to, to access it. It's available directly out of the, the archive class. And we, we expect that, you know, even though this is data that you don't want to ever access, if you do need to access it, like there's a regulatory uh, reason that you need to suddenly get your data back and run some analytics, here you won't have to go through a, a week-long, multi-week-long period to get access to your data. Um, and it's also stored with very high durability. One of the problems with tape historically has been you really have to write it to tape, you have to validate that it's been correctly written, um, and it's often the case that when people go back to tapes that they find that their data isn't there uh, the way they thought it is. Um, and libra tape libraries can be very finicky devices. So with cloud storage, and if, if you select the archive class, it's stored with the same 11.9's durability that, you can com that you've come to expect from all of our storage classes. So we're very excited about this announcement. Uh, archive will be available uh, later this year, so stay tuned for availability. And if you do choose archive, I want to mention in multi-regions or in dual regions, same level of geo-redundancy applies as, as, the other, uh, as the other location types would imply. So it, very consistent across, consistent APIs, consistent level of geo-redundancy. So what are the best practices on selecting the storage classes? So hopefully you've already, you've already selected a location type that's appropriate for the amount of availability that, you, that, that your, your application cares about. Um, but basically, it's a combination of retention period and access frequency. So if you're going to access data very frequently, or if you're not going to keep it very long, then the standard class is, is going to give you the best possible price point. Um, whereas if you're going to store it for, uh, let's say, 10 years and never read it, um, then clearly archive will be the best choice. And in the middle, fit uh, near line and cold line. So generally speaking, if, it, if, it's, if you're accessing it less frequently than once a year and storing for more than 12 months, that's what the, where the new archive class is, uh, fits in. Um, but we have a lot of use of near line and cold line, especially for long tail content archives where they, they, the data is expected to be read maybe every month on average, and that's where the, those middle uh, tiers uh, make sense. And then to, to unify all of this, it's great to have a consistent API, but it's also useful to have a policy-driven mechanism for, uh, for down-leveling the tiers of your storage as the data gets colder. And so we provide that with the Object Lifecycle Manager. You can basically specify, like, b based on the age of objects, usually that correlates very well uh, with the frequency of access. So based on your data set, if you understand that in this example, that after 30 days, your data really should move off of standard and move into near line, then after, then after 90 days to cold line, and then after half a year to archive, you can set up those policies, and then your objects will automatically tear down um, to the appropriate level. Um, and of course, uh, because of the changes that we made with the, with the storage, with the location types, um, you're, you don't have to worry about losing uh, durability or losing geo-redundancy as that tiering happens. So if you choose a multi-regional location, for example, your data will stay geo-redundant the whole way down. So you, it, that means consistent availability characteristics and consistent durability. So now I want to talk a little bit about application of some of these storage classes to workloads. So I'll take you through content serving and then pass the baton over to Mike, who will uh, take the presentation over from there. So for content serving, there are actually some interesting cases. Uh, we have a lot of customers that do uh, direct serving, but some use uh, cloud CDNs. Uh, some use custom front ends but before serving the data, and they're also, we also have um, compelling use cases with our independent uh, content delivery partners uh, where they may be taking over the, 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 the last mile 
uh, distribution. And these all can mean uh, some slightly different things for what storage class you might ideally want to select. So multi-regions uh, see the most use for direct serving. And this is because if you're serving to either the whole US or, to, or even to the whole globe, uh, you don't really care about where the data is located. You just want geo-redundancy for the highest availability, and you want it to be uh, and taking advantage all of, 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 the, uh, of all of the caching that, that Google makes available. So we have uh, cache control headers that allow you to state to control that caching, but generally speaking, as soon as, it, uh, as an object has already been read in a particular point of presence, it will be cached there and very low latency for subsequent accesses. So we do en encourage you to take ad advantage of the, of the cache control headers for direct serving. To optimize direct serving further, you can take advantage of our cloud CDN product. And what this allows you to do is basically avoid a lot of the more expensive egress uh, pricing if, it's, if you're um, in the cases of cache hits. So this, um, and, and the other part of what this does is it allows you to, um, to get um, HTTPS and custom domains, some flexibility on the URL side. Um, but fundamentally, it just takes the, 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 the caching capability that's already there in the base product and gives you a little bit more capability and some opportunity for co some cost savings on the egress side. So that's very commonly used um, as part of the direct serving model. So, so far, that's pretty much all a multi-regional use case. Custom front ends where multi-regions may no longer make as much sense. So this is where you want to actually put VMs in front of your content serving because you're going to manipulate the, the data in some way before it gets sent out to your customers. And in that case, the, the overall latency from storage to your customer's access is both the latency from storage and then the latency from the VM. And so that if you want to, to, to minimize the overall latency, it's important to actually co-locate the storage with the, the VMs that are accessing it. So here you want to either use a region or a dual region to store the, the, the data ideally, so that you'll know that the storage is local to the region in which it's being accessed by your front ends. If you want geo-redundancy, use a dual region, and then you can have your VMs in both of the regions. If it's very low performance, um, you may still get away with multi-regions. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but generally speaking, you might be better off with regions and dual regions. And then you can also um, use um, independent content delivery networks. Um, some of our partners are, are shown here on this slide. Uh, it may be that they have particular APIs, feature sets that are particularly well aligned to the market that the content is being served to. Um, it may be that the particular po uh, pops that they have are in better alignment there, are or maybe the egress pricing offers some advantages. It depends on the scenario, but we work very closely with these partners, and, um, and it's, a, it's a great alternative if, if for some reason the direct serving or, or our own CDN capabilities uh, fall short. So here you would want to use regional or dual regions, again, for the same region reason. Typically, um, there will be something that's called an origin shield uh, that's placed between Google and, the, and that uh, CDN partner. And what the origin shield does is it basically ensures that the, that the cache filling is going to that origin shield uh, directly from, from Google, and it prevents a ton of access from hitting, um, going back and hitting Google at the same time. So it ends up being the intermediary between uh, Google and the CDN partner. So if you have that origin shield layer co-located as closely as possible with the storage, again, you, you, you help with the overall latency. So at this point, I'd like to, to pass the baton to Mike Yu, who will take you through the next section. Great. Thanks, Jeff. OK, so we're going to quickly go through storage class selection and location type selection for computing and analytics. And then I'll talk a little bit about some general performance and scaling tips. So um, one of the things I think is a little bit interesting here is that in your computer an analytics pipelines, there's actually several types of data. And your choice of location type depends on the type of data. So first of all, you have source data. This is data that's typically persistent, and you need to load up uh, when you start up your pipeline. And here, what's really important is very high throughput, so you want co-location between your workers and your data. So region and dual region makes sense. The second type is intermediate data. And here, this one's a little bit uh, interesting. This is data that's produced by one stage of your pipeline and consumed by the next. And it doesn't actually always make sense to use GCS here. We've actually found a lot of users who need higher throughput, high, lower latency. 
And this data is very short-lived, and so sometimes using something like local SSD makes sense. There are also sometimes specialized services like a uh, shuffle service that you can get higher performance. The third type of data is uh, what I call side inputs and staging data. So this is data that's typically read once per worker. Uh, it's loaded all uh, up together, but then after that, it's never read again. And here, the, the type of location doesn't really matter that much. And the reason why is that GCS ends up doing a lot of caching behind the scenes. And so you're fetching the same data over and over. So even if it's remote the first time, subsequent times are typically uh, nice and fast. And then finally, uh, there's final outputs. You know, what does your, your pipeline actually produce? And here, the location type and storage class really depends on what you're going to do with the final output. So if you're, if you're producing, say, process images that you're going to serve out to uh, internet users, you'd probably want to use the advice that Jeff gave on content serving and choose a storage class based off of that. Uh, if instead this is going to be data that's going to be fed into another pipeline, then it would, it would end up acting like source data again, and you would want to use regional or dual regional. Uh, I wanted to give a quick blurb because we've been seeing a lot of uh, uh, interest in using, moving Hadoop workloads to the cloud. And so I wanted to give a shout out to our cloud data proc service, which is a managed Hadoop service. Uh, it lets you bring up clusters very, very quickly. And we also have a connector that allows you to access your, your source data and your final outputs directly from GCS without having to load it first into HDFS. So you can save a bit of time um, by skipping that step. Uh, there are a couple of gotchas. Object storage is not a uh, file system, so we don't have directory semantics today. So you're going to want to work around those and, and eliminate your dependency on atomic directory operations. So for example, one common pattern that we see is that you might write uh, data temporarily into a temporary directory, and then when your data set is complete, you'll rename it to a final directory. And an alternate approach is to go ahead and write that into the final directory and when your data set is complete, write a Sentinel file that says, hey, my, my, I'm, I'm done with the data. Um, I'll talk a little bit uh, in a bit on uh, performance, but you're going to see that object storage is going to have higher latency overall compared to uh, HDFS. And so you're going to want to favor parallelization to get around that. And then finally, uh, like I already mentioned, you may want to use local SSD for temporary data. OK, so let's now talk about some performance and scaling tips, which I think are really applicable across uh, multiple use cases. So I think the first thing to understand is, is the general performance characteristics of object storage. And the TLDR is that, ob that latency for small objects is relatively high. So at 95th percentile, you might expect like a one byte read to take about 100 milliseconds, give or take. It, it depends a bit on the hotness of the object. but around 100 milliseconds, and similarly for writes. Um, on the flip side, I think where our strengths are are, of course, horizontal scalability and then single stream throughput. So with an object that's large enough, you should be able to get about 800 megabits or about 100 megabytes per second. And for writes, you can get about 400 megabits per second. So what this means is that you're going to really want to try to favor larger object sizes. If you have, if you have options in terms of how to pack your data, uh, don't shard them unnecessarily. Try to keep the objects relatively large. Because as you can see on the graph on the right, you're not really able to take advantage of the single stream throughput until you get to larger object sizes. Um, similarly, even if you are able to pack all your data into larger objects, you may have internal, if you have structured data, you may have internal segments or pages. And if you can, you want to tune those to be a little bit larger. We recommend about two megabytes. If you can go larger, it's even better, but you're going to have to it's sort of a trade-off between how much you read at once and how much uh, effort is wasted, uh, depending on your query. And then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes you can't uh, create larger objects. You have, no, you have no choice, and that's OK. Just make sure you parallelize so that you, you work around the uh, inherent latency that's in the service and that you can, you can increase your throughput that way. So next, let's talk a little bit about writing objects and how to get the best performance out of writes. Uh, there's actually three high-level strategies you can use for writes. The simplest one is just a non-resumable upload. Right? You, you issue a single request, you upload your entire object. The second strategy is to do uh, what we call a resumable upload. So we have a protocol where you first send a request to initiate a new resumable upload session, and you get back a unique session ID. And then you issue a second request where you upload your, your data. And 
Hopefully that succeeds, but if it fails, what you can end up doing is you can query the server and say, hey, what was the last offset that you were successfully able to commit? And once you have that offset, you can then issue another upload request and uh, only upload the bytes that the server hasn't received. The th third approach is uh, parallel upload. So you can upload, you can, you can split your object into parts, you can upload them, and then you can do a compose. The compose operation is a metadata-only operation, so it, uh, it's constant time. It, it, it doesn't rewrite any of the bytes. Uh, and if you, if you have your entire object up front, you can, of course, split it up front and upload those parts. Uh, you, know, you can get the sharding done right away. If you're doing a streaming uh, approach and you don't know what the final object size is, you can iteratively uh, chunk your buffer, upload that in chunks, compose, and then do it again for the next set of bytes in your buffer. So I think, uh, you know, obviously, you want to use non-resumable uploads by default. But I think what's not really um, always clear is how high of a bar you want to use before you switch over to resumable upload. Um, resumable uploads have uh, several disadvantages. One of the big ones is that they require a minimum of two requests. And if you imagine that that first request takes something on the order of, say, 100 milliseconds, that means for small objects, that 100 milliseconds is a large part of uh, the overall upload time. So it's a, it's a large amount of overhead. So the, the general rule of thumb I like to use is take your expected throughput, multiply it by about 30 seconds, and that's a reasonable cutoff time for, uh, for the object size before you want to switch over to resumable uploads. Uh, what that means is that you're going to lose at most 30 seconds of effort if something goes wrong, and things go wrong very rarely usually. Uh, it also means that as you hit that 30 second threshold, the amount of overhead that that first request adds is relatively small, less than half a percent, right? And so to give some concrete numbers, if you have clients that are using, say, uh, cable, um, cable modem access, and they have a four megabit per second upload speed, then the cutoff is going to be about 15 megabytes. Similarly, if you have a VM that's you know, on our network, you're getting the full 400 megabits per second, you shouldn't really be even considering resume uploads until about you know, over a gig or so. So it's fairly large objects before you, you really want to care about this. And then finally, if uh, resumable uploads have a high bar, I would say parallel uploads have an even higher bar. You really only want, there's a lot of additional complexity that, that you add with this, so it's, it's not something you want to do lightly. Um, you should really only do this if you are you know, uploading from a VM and you really need greater than 400 megabits per second. That typically means you're talking of very, very large object sizes, right? Tens of gigabytes or more. Um, there is one other use case, which is that certain connections have relatively high bandwidth, but a relatively high delay. And due to uh, the way TCP works, you sometimes are not able to fill your pipe. In those cases, sometimes having multiple connections is beneficial. OK, so next I want to talk about retries. Uh, it sounds a little bit dry, but it it's actually uh, has a big impact on both the reliability and the performance that you're going to get. So, Right here, I have a pretty typical retry strategy. It's exponential back off. We have a loop. You know, we make a call. There's a deadline. Uh, if there's a retriable error, we back off exponentially, and then we give up after, after a fixed number of attempts. So there's, um, I think, two tricky things to consider here. So first of all, right now, with every attempt, we're reissuing the same request. And so there's a question of, is that the right strategy for getting the best reliability? The second question is, we have this deadline. So what's the right deadline? Um, you know, if you do it too short or too long, that has impact on performance or reliability. So let's look into those uh, one by one. So first of all, I think the key thing with retries is you really want to be failing over, if at all possible. So this is sort of a simplified you know, view of what uh, cloud storage might look like uh, in this implementation. We have a set of front ends. They're running on multiple servers, and they're stateless, so you can really hit any of those servers. Then we have a set of metadata servers, and those are stateful. And so for any given object, you need to go to a specific subset of those servers. And similarly, we have data servers, and you can only use a specific subset. So those are represented in blue. So imagine a user makes a request for a specific object. It hits one of the front ends. It hits one of the metadata servers. It hits one of the data servers, and something goes wrong. Well, if if the error happens at the metadata or data level, then Cloud Storage is going to take care of retrying automatically, and it's going to fail over to the alternate replica. So this should all happen under the hoods. So that's great because it, it means we're not retrying the same unhealthy node, right? The problem is what happens if the front end itself is unhealthy? 
a naive retry strategy would end up reusing the same TCP connection or the same HTTP connection, and you'll end up hitting the same unhealthy front end, right? So it's pretty important that when you do your retry, make sure you're actually opening up a new connection. Uh, our load balancing will typically send that to a different uh, server, and you're unlikely, and that'll cause proper failover. So let's also talk about deadlines now. I mentioned that if it's too short or too long, there's, there's repercussions. So if you're setting a deadline that's too short, the biggest problem is that you might be prematurely canceling or failing a request that could have succeeded if you were just willing to wait a little bit longer. And that ends up driving up your error rate uh, artificially. It uh, ends up wasting work, right? Similarly, if you set a deadline that's too long, the problem is that you may sit around waiting too long for a request that's never going to succeed. And if you had just retried a little earlier, you could have really cut down that latency. Right? So, so what do you do? What we recommend doing is a technique called hedge requests. The problem with the previous algorithm is that each attempt had to run individually. They couldn't run in parallel. So if you instead issue your, your retries in parallel, what that allows you to do is each individual attempt can have a long deadline so that uh, you know, we wait for a long enough time in case the whole service is, down, is slow. And at the same time, you can shorten the delay before issuing that second request so that you can really cut down on your tail latency. So let me walk, I can walk through this a little bit uh, more detail to hopefully make it more clear. So imagine you, uh, you, you issue you, your initial attempt. And it's taking a little while to come back. In fact, it's a, it's a little beyond normal. Um, one, one good way to implement this uh, is to track what your typical P95 latency is, say, over the last minute or two. And so you, can, you wait, and you haven't received a response after hitting your P95 latency. So what you can go ahead and do is issue that retry, that second attempt. But don't cancel the first one. Let it keep going, right? And if this is a scenario where that first attempt happened to hit a slow node and, and it's just taking a while and the second attempt fails over properly, then you'd expect that second attempt to, to uh, succeed pretty quickly. And so you've really cut down your latency quite a bit, right? Uh, if, on the other hand, let's suppose this first request was taking a long time, not because you hit a, a single slow node, but maybe the service is having issues overall. Well, because you've set a long deadline for each of these requests, you didn't cancel that first one. And so that allows that first request to succeed. It will be, of course, slow, but at least you're not wasting work or throwing away um, or, or causing errors prematurely. So that's head requests. And I wanted to throw out two other things that I think are pretty important, especially if you do use head requests. I think the, the first one is, is to make sure to limit your, your retry volume. And of course, this helps us, the service, we, uh, you know, from, from getting slammed uh, when things are unhealthy, but it also helps your client. And if you notice in the previous hedge request uh, slides, I, I suggested you waiting for the P95 latency before issuing the hedge request. That means in steady state, you're only issuing about 5% extra traffic, right? But the problem is that latency can temporarily spike. If it temporarily spikes, then you could be issuing up to 100% extra traffic. And so limiting your retry volume to a smaller subset, say 10%, uh, is, is generally a good practice. The other thing uh, that to be careful about with retries is making sure you have item posts and sequences. This is something that we've seen a few different users um, forget about, and it, it can cause serious problems like data loss. So I thought it was worth going into that really quickly to, um, to explore that. So a non item posted sequence is a sequence of operations where if you repeat the entire sequence or a subsequence, you may, uh, uh, it's item potent if you always end up with the same state. It's not item potent if it's possible to end up in a different state. So here's an example of a non item potent sequence. Imagine we create an object X, and that creates generation number one. Then we issue a delete operation, which deletes it. And then we follow it up by creating a new version of that object. So that's generation number two. So this shows what happens in the, the sort of normal case where no errors occur. So Here's an example of what can happen if an error occurs and you issue a retry. So imagine the, the initial create succeeds. Your initial delete request takes a long time, and so you time out. Right? And when you time out, you issue that retry. And that retry succeeds. So now you've deleted generation number one. You then go ahead and create the object again, and you've created generation number two. And 
The problem is, is that very first delete attempt, even though you timed it out on the client side, it was actually stuck in one of the buffers in our server, one of the queues in our server. And so it does end up getting applied and ends up deleting the generation two object that you just created. So this is a data loss scenario. So you really want to make sure that your sequences are item potent to avoid this type of problem. Uh, one, one way of doing that is to use preconditions. So uh, in this example, we can really make sure, rather than saying delete object x, we can say delete object x generation one only. And that ensures that that dark request that came in afterwards, or that finished afterwards, gets canceled, because it's, it's no longer relevant to the current generation of the object, which is generation two. Uh, there are other ways of doing this. Um, another common technique for doing this is to simply ne never overwrite objects with new content. Right? So you can write once, and uh, if, if you ever have to rewrite, it's always rewriting the same content. OK. Um, finally, I wanted to end and talk a little bit about scaling and, um, and hotspotting. And generally speaking, sca scaling is something that cloud storage does pretty well. You don't typically have to worry about your data size or the, the object count. Um, we just scale horizontally, uh, usually without worry. But there's one case that we have seen a lot of folks get tripped up on, and that is localized hotspotting, uh, which can also result in scaling bottlenecks as well. And so I want to give a little bit of uh, intuition and background for what's happening under the hoods, and then some uh, advice on, on how to uh, work around this. So Cloud Storage uses um, a scaling uh, or sharding strategy called range-based sharding. And so what that means is we, of course, store your objects on multiple servers. And the way we assign objects to servers is we split up our, your object namespace into ranges. So in this example, uh, an object starting with uh, C would go into that first shard. An object starting with M would go into the second shard. And we chose this strategy for a very specific purpose, which is to provide consistent listing. Right? So imagine a user issues a request to list every object starting with T slash. In order to fill this request, it's pretty simple. The request needs to get routed to a single shard, this uh, S shard. And that shard is sufficient to, uh, to service the entire request. We know that there are no objects starting with T in any of the other shards. So let's look at an alternative approach to what we could have done. Right? The alternative approach is to do something uh, like hash-based sharding where you take the object name, you hash it, and then you um, assign it to one of the shards based off of the hash. And that really distributes the objects all over the place. So this same listing operation now, what happens? In order to service a request, you have to look at every single shard, right? Because you don't know where the t, st t slash objects are going to be. And what happens if a shard is slow? You have to wait for it. So as the number of shards increases, you're going to hit that tail latency. Your overall listing latency is going gonna, is gonna to go up. Right? Um, perhaps even worse, what happens if one of the shards fails? Then you're stuck with a sort of poor choice. You can either return incomplete results, or you can fail the, the overall request. And again, as the number of shards increases, you're, if, assuming you're failing the re overall request, your chance of success goes way down. So, because of this, uh, hash-based sharding really doesn't scale well when you're trying to provide consi strongly consistent listing. And so we've gone with range-based sharding. So of course, one of your shards can get hot. And we, we do auto-scaling. We detect that. And we split those shards uh, you know, in half or more uh, to try to distribute load. And I wanted to give a feel for when this becomes an issue. You should expect about 1,000 uh, object writes per second and about 5,000 reads per second. There are, that's probably a little bit conservative, but that's roughly what you can expect for any given shard. And then when a shard gets hot, we try to split ahead of time so that you don't notice things. But you can expect a delay of about 20 minutes if you are slamming a particular shard. That's also, again, probably a little bit conservative. But I think it's good to keep in mind because this is about when you're going to run into the, these type of problems. right? And in order for this to work well, I think the key thing is to make sure you're distributing your load evenly. If you have nice, consistent, even load, then we can really detect shards getting hot, and we can split them uh, well ahead of that and becoming a problem. So there's one uh, common pattern that essentially uh, trips up a lot of, uh, a lot of uses. So, 
and that's sequential access. And, and let's go through why this is, a, is problematic. So by sequential ob access, I mean you know, reading or writing objects uh, in order of their name, right, in lexicographical order. And in this example, we have G-H-I-J-K, so pretty simple. And you can see that these accesses are distributed across two range-based shards. But the biggest problem here is that even though overall the accesses are distributed across those two shards, if you take a look at any particular time range, it's always lasering one shard at a time. So you don't actually get the scaling properties of having two different shards. You're, you're really bound by the limit of a single shard. Right? So that's, uh, that's what we mean by hotspotting. You're really lasering this one shard. You know, a potential way around this is to go ahead and say, OK, well, let's split these shards up into smaller ranges, right? And this definitely does help spread the load, um, but it causes fragmentation. And fragmentation is a problem, again, because of consistent listing, right? Previously, with a, a low fragmentation, the list operation can hit a relatively few number of shards. With uh, high fragmentation, you end up having to hit many shards and you start running into the same late tail latency and uh, availability problems that you would get with hash-based sharding. So this is, um, I wanted to go through this because it's a sort of a fundamental trade-off that you have to make, and it's, it's pretty difficult to get around this. So here are some common naming patterns that we see that cause this type of um, uh, sequential access. So one of them is using uh, year, month, day. Uh, you know, you see this a lot with like writing logs, for example. Um, you also see things like having order numbers or user IDs that are sequential, uh, just counting up monotonically. And then um, similarly, we also see uh, use of timestamps. So these are three common patterns that we see that, that can cause problems. Uh, there are a couple ways you can work around this if you need to. And again, I, I wanted to reemphasize it really only becomes a problem after 1,000 writes per second or 5,000 reads per second. So oftentimes, this isn't an issue. Uh, one of the things you can do is, uh, I'm going to just call it like manually partitioning your prefixes. So in this example, we pulled the log type up front, right? And that means that if I'm processing a single day across multiple log types, I'm going to end up hitting multiple prefixes at once, and then I'm going to get a fixed um, multiplication of the sharding, right? The uh, second approach is to just don't use sequential IDs if you don't have to, right? So for order numbers, if you don't really need that count of the number of orders, for example, just use a UUID, and that'll spread uh, load more evenly. The third approach is you can end up taking a hash of your object name and putting that into your prefix, right? And so in this particular example, I, I didn't hash the entire name, but I hashed the timestamp, and I, I put that up front. And this gives you really good uh, even load balancing. The big drawback is that you no longer get in order listing, right? So this, again, so this only works if, if you don't really need to list in order. And finally, there's an alternative um, that you can do that's a little bit in between. You can hash and then map it to a fixed number of shards. And what this ends up allowing you to do is it allows you to preserve the in order listing by issuing 10 listing operations in parallel, one to each shard, and merging the results. So it's extra work, but if in-order listing is absolutely something you need and you, you also need to get around the scaling limitations, this is an approach that you can take. Uh, finally, I, I wanted to mention all, all the previous uh, um, alternatives I mentioned were around naming. You don't always have to actually change a name. In the case of bulk operations, you can simply make sure that your access is spread evenly and, and randomly. So for example, if I'm running a, a batch job across my entire corpus, I could have the, the different workers uh, process different directories simultaneously, and that would cause more even load. Um, you can also choose, randomly choose which objects to process, and that'll distribute the load uh, a little bit more evenly as well. So uh, with that, th those are the, um, the, you know, hopefully you found it useful. That's, that's the main uh, tips that we wanted to provide today. We didn't cover a lot of other areas. I know there's a lot of tips in security. There's a lot of tips around archival. So I wanted to give a quick plug. We have uh, 10 other storage talks that are ongoing. The ones in blue, these are ones that haven't been held yet. So if you want to catch them live and they're, they're interesting to you, um, I'd encourage you to do that. The ones that aren't highlighted, they've already happened, but they should be on YouTube pretty soon. And so um, there's, there's good tips on, you know, for example, seeing how Twitter is migrating their 
their workload to us uh, for a very high intensity compute use case, um, and also how to do things like transferring your data in. So um, hopefully uh, everyone found that useful. Jeff and I are going to hang out afterwards, and we're happy to answer questions uh, that you might have. So thank you. <laughs>